This is chapter eight exam review, We're looking at powers and roots. So in 8.1, we just started looking at the multiplication counting principle, which means if we have a bunch of different choices to go through, for each decision, we can multiply the number of choices and find out the total number of possibilities that there are. This can be done making a tree um, and writing out every single possibility, but as the numbers get bigger, that becomes more and more tedious. And so the counting principle just helps us get there faster. So looking at the first question, an art supply store sells tubes of paint in four sizes and in three different brands. So if that was all we were looking at is three different brands and four sizes, we would multiply those together. There'd be 12 different possibilities, right? We have three different brands, each one of them in four different sizes. So that's 12 possibilities, but the paint also comes in five different colors. So Every brand comes in four sizes and five colors. So we need to multiply those all together, four times three times five, and that gets you 60 possibilities. So it makes your life very simple. Next one, an internet password requires three letters. For this type, I like to actually put blanks. And we're gonna fill them in with the number of possibilities and two digits. We'll talk about that in a second. So how many passwords are possible? So digits are numbers single numbers, single digit numbers, and we have letters. And so when you choose a letter, there are 26 letters to choose from in the alphabet. Now, if you couldn't use the letter again, you'd have to put a 25 here and then a 24 here because you would have used a letter you can't pick it now. But it does not say that you could have AAA or BBB. Okay, so every time you choose, all 26 letters are available to you. So it's 26, 26, 26. Now, here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are your choices, but you also have zero. Everyone always forgets about zero. So there are actually 10 numbers to choose from. And if you're allowed to repeat a number, there are still 10 numbers to choose from. So it's 26 times itself three times, times 10 times itself two times. And you could go ahead and multiply it all the way out. And we get 1,757,000. Six hundred options. So you can see tons of options based on just three letters and two numbers. Okay, moving on to eight two products and powers of powers. So going back to our exponent properties, first of all, when we are multiplying whole numbers, we ignore all our exponent rules and multiply like normal. So three times five is just going to be fifteen. But when we are multiplying similar bases that have exponents, we keep the base. And we add the exponent. So this is going to be a to the sixth. And again, the reason is because is a to the fourth is a times itself four times, and a to the second is a times itself twice. So this is really just a times itself six times. So you're adding the four and the two. All right, the power rule says when you raise a power to a power, you multiply those powers. So we're going to ignore the two for a second. k to the tenth raised to the seventh. That would be k to the tenth written out. So k times k times k ten times. That seven times, so 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, seven times. So that's 70. So the rule says raise a power to a power and multiply. So it's k to the 70th. And then that's going to get times by two, but that two is just a coefficient, just stays out from. All right, looking at this one, you have to do powers first following order of operations. So raising to a power, this becomes k to the 15th. So we have 4k to the second times k to the 15th. And so the four is gonna just be basically multiplied by a coefficient of one, so it's four. And when you multiply k squared times k to the 15th, you're adding your exponents, because when you multiply, you add them, and then it's k to the 17th. All right, eight, three, we moved on to quotients of powers, and it's just the opposite, just as multiplying and dividing are opposites. So when we multiply, we add the exponents. When we divide, we subtract the exponents. So we have, g to the 10th divided by g to the 4th. So you're going to subtract and get g to the 6th. And the numbers, we go ahead and divide if we can divide them because they're just coefficients. They act like normal numbers. Now, 27 divided by 18, you could get that down to a decimal if you wanted to. Okay. Um, if, or you can simplify. Now, we know 9 goes into both of these. So if I divided these by 9, I would get 3 over 2. And you'll notice on the answer key, it wrote three over one. That's just a mistake. So there's a mistake on the answer key for this problem. If you did three divided by two, you get 1.5 or 27 divided by 18, you get 1.5. So you can put the 1.5 here in front. 
Next one, we have 81 divided by 36. That's 2.25. So you could simplify if you wanted to, divide them by 9, or you could put that decimal out front either way. I'm just going to go ahead and put the decimal, which is different than the answer key, and that's fine. You have p to the fourth over p to the first, so that becomes p to the third. And then you have r to the first minus r to the fourth. So that's going to be r to the negative third, and we don't leave our answers with negative exponents. So it would have to get thrown to the bottom to become positive, and so it ends up on the bottom, and your r to the third is right here. If you had left it with the numbers and you divide it by 9, you would have 9 over... 4, if you divide both of these by 9, and you'd have p to the third, r to the third. The other way to think about it is you have 1 on top and 4 on the bottom. This 1 cancels one of these, but that means there are still 3 sitting there on the bottom. So two different ways to look at it. All right, 30 divided by 42. Not a nice decimal at all, so we definitely don't want to leave this one as a decimal. So just looking at those... I think we can divide by 6. So if we divide 30 by 6, that's 5. And 42 by 6, that's 7. Look at the M's. You have 8 over 5. So these 5 cancel 5 of these. That means there's still 3 on top. And these 2 cancel 2 of these, which means there are still 2 on top. And so our final answer looks like this. All right, now dealing specifically with some negative exponents. To fix a negative exponent and make it positive, you put it to the bottom of the fraction. If it's already in the bottom, it moves to the top. Okay, by crossing over that line or fraction bar, okay, we changed it from negative to positive. So all we have to do in this one, we can leave the 3 and the a squared alone. And b to the negative fifth is going to shift to the bottom, which there was just a 1 there, which we don't write. And it becomes b to the positive 5. Okay, next one. 32 divided by 16 is 2. And when we have this, you can go ahead and do the subtraction if you want. It's negative 4 minus 2, which is negative 6. So you would have c to the negative 6, which has to go to the bottom. And you end up with c to the positive 6 down here. And that's our final answer. That's one way to think about it. Or you could have seen that there was a negative and made it positive by moving it to the bottom, so c to the fourth. So now you have c to the second and c to the fourth on the bottom, so those go together to make c to the sixth, so another way to think about it. All right, 56 and 8, that divides nicely, so you're going to get negative 7. Um, let's see, we could, let's do it by moving it. So we're going to move this negative down, it makes it positive. So now we have all these positives on the bottom, they're going to stay there but combine, so it's m to the eighth. I have a negative 1. I'm going to bring it to the bottom to make it positive. Now I have all these positives down here. They're going to combine to make n to the 7th. Again, you could have subtracted using your quotient rule. Negative 6 minus 2 is negative 8. Because it's negative, we put it on the bottom. And then same thing here. Negative 1 minus 6 is negative 7. So you have n to the negative 7 goes to the bottom to become positive. All right, kind of combining our powers and products. So we're going to simplify each of the following. Now, everything here is in parentheses, which means 5 is being raised to the third and t to the second is being raised to the third. So 5 raised to the third is 5 times 5 times 5. So 125, even if you don't have a fancy calculator. So we have 125 and t to the second raised to the third. We know the power rule says we just multiply, and so that's going to be t to the sixth power. Next one, exponents before multiplication. So we're going to take care of raising all of this to the fourth power, and then the 2 is just going to get multiplied. So we're going to leave the 2 alone right now. x squared to the fourth becomes x to the eighth. You multiply. y to the first raised to the fourth. You multiply, and that's y to the fourth. And that is done. There's nothing to do there. And when we have a fraction like this, everything is going to get the power of 3. So 19 raised to the third, 6, 8, 5, 9. The y is going to get the third power, and the 2 is going to get the third power, which is 8. And there's nothing to clean up there. That is done. All right, square roots, cubed roots. So first, we just started talking about evaluating using a calculator. So we're going to evaluate and round our answers to the nearest hundredth. So just plugging them in the calculator. Remember, if you have a phone, you can turn it sideways, and you'll get your scientific calculator for the end. It'll have a square root. 
So square rooting 85 and rounding to the nearest hundredth, so tenths hundredths. The second spot, so that is 9.2. The second spot's a 1, but the 9 increases it when we round it to a 2. In here, you would want to add these first. So 64 plus 9. All right, is 73. So we're really taking the square root of 73. And then here's hundredth, we're going five, four. And because the next number is a four, we're not changing it. So it's 8.54. All right, we talked about how do we get this cubed root? And so on this calculator, we go to math and we scroll down to number four, you will find your cubed root and we put in 9.261 and depending on your calculator there's different ways to find that number and that one happens to just be 2.1 and this one we should know we just did it we did 5 raised to the third and it was 125 so that means the cubed root of 125 what number times itself three times is 125 well that's just five and if we need to double check it we're going to hit math we're going to go down to cubed root 125 and you can see that it's 5. Okay next we talked about Pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared where c is always our hypotenuse which is across from the 90 and the two sides that come out from your legs are your a and your b. So we're going to squeeze all this work in here. We're going to have 9 squared plus 11 squared equals y squared. y has to go in the c spot that is the hypotenuse. So we're going to have 81 plus 121 equals y squared. That comes out to 202. And we're right in the nearest tenth. That means we are getting a decimal. So we don't want y squared. We want just y. So to get the square root of y squared, we've got to take the square root on both sides. So we're going to square root 202. And nearest tenth is the first spot, 14.2. No rounding there. The 1 leaves it alone. So 14.2. 2. 13. I'm going to squeeze it in right here. The two legs are the x and the 39. So it's x squared plus 39 squared. Hypotenuse or the c is 65. So x squared plus 39 squared is 1521. 65 squared is 4225. I can't start square rooting it. I need the x squared by itself. So I'm going to minus the 15. 21 from both sides, so it leaves me just x squared. When I subtract here, it is 2704. I don't want x squared, so I'm going to take the square root, and then I get x, and I'm going to round it if I need to, 2704. Happens to be a nice whole number of 52, so x is 52. All right, and 14, my legs are 4 and y. So 4 squared plus y squared equals whatever the c is, cross from the 90, so 25 squared. So 14 squared is 16, y squared stays. 25 times 25 is 625. Then we're going to go ahead and we are going to subtract to get y by itself. So we have y squared equals, we are left with 609, and we're going to take the square root. And we're right in the nearest tenth, so tenths places the 6, but the 7 next to it will bump it up. So our final answer here is 24.7. All right, multiplying and dividing our square roots in 8.7. A couple more properties here to talk about, and then simplest radical form. So we are not plugging these in the calculator. We're going to simplify them. So looking at the first one, you have a square root divided by a square root. If I tried to take the actual square root of 108 and 6, taking those individual square roots, those are not nice numbers. That's going to be a nasty decimal. Square root of 6, nasty decimal, right? So I don't want to do that. But... The property says if it's a square root on top and the bottom, it's the same thing as saying the square root of just 108 over 6. So why does that make a difference? If I do 108 divided by 6, I get 18. So that means this is equal to the square root of 18. 
Now the square root of 18 is also is not nice, right? That's not a perfect square, but this is where simplest radical form comes in. I can split this into numbers that can be multiplied into this, like six and three, like nine and two, but the whole point is one of them needs a nice square root. If I think of six and three, there is no square root of six, there is no square root of three, that's a whole number. But the square root of nine times the square root of two, that's gonna work out nicely for us because the square root of nine is three. So we've split it into two pieces and one of them is a perfect square. And so the square root of nine is three. Final answer here is going to be three radical two. The two stays, the nine becomes the three. All right, looking at this one, we actually really didn't go quite this far. So let's take a look at this one a little more carefully. First of all, square root of 36 is going to be just six. Six times six is 36. But how do we simplify p to the third? So we want to split p to the third into something that has a square root. And we didn't look that closely at this type of problem when we were studying this section. But I can split this up right here like this because p to the P squared times P to the first is P to the third, right? So this is fine. Now, why would I do it? That's because the square root of P squared is P. Think about it when we have X squared equals whatever over here. We take the square root on both sides and this becomes X. And that's because X times X or P times P, P to the first times P to the first is P squared. So when you take the square root of P to the second, it just becomes P. But we are still going to have this square root of p. So we're going to save that. That's going to get attached. This is gone, has become just p. Square root of p squared is p. q to the fourth, we can actually kind of just leave alone. So you're thinking about what times itself gives me q to the fourth. Well, that would be q squared. q squared times q squared equals q to the fourth. So the square root of q to the fourth is q squared. And again, we still have the square root of p out here, so that has to stay. Again, we didn't quite go that far when we were doing these, so it's nice to see it. You'll see it again in the future, Algebra 2, okay? But for now, just kind of going through the process here. All right, looking at the next one, because I have a square root times a square root, I can actually put all of this underneath the square root. And from there, I can just go ahead and kind of put things together and figure out what's going to simplify. So I have 6 and 12, which is 72, which doesn't have a nice square root. a to the fifth, and a is a to the sixth, and b times b is b squared. Now, all of this is still under the square root. So 72 can be split into two nice pieces, 36 and 2. 36 has a square root. So this is going to be a 6. There's still going to be a radical 2, so I'm going to put that over here to remind myself that it ends up in here somewhere. Square root of a to the 6th is a to the 3rd, because a to the 3rd times a to the 3rd is a to the 6th. Square root of b squared is b. b times b is b squared. And so we have taken the square root of 36, a to the 6th, b to the 2nd. The only thing left over is the square root of 2, or radical 2, and we can't do anything with that, and so it just stays on. Again, a little bit farther than we went when we studied this this year. What about 405? We need to split this into something that has a square root. So when I first look at this one, I'm going to start trying numbers. 405 divided by 9. Well, that works. So I could have a 45 and a 9. But when I look at 45, I recognize that 9 goes into it again. So I would have to go further. So since 9 goes in basically twice, it goes into the 405 and it also goes in here. That puts in my head 9 times 9 is 81. 81 probably goes into this. So 405 divided by 81, sure enough, is 5. So I can split this into the square root of 81 and the square root of 5. Now, why would I want that? It's because the square root of 81 is 9. So this is 9 radical 5. This one, nice and easy, I see right away this is 36 and 10. And I love 36 because it has a square root. It's 6. And square root of 10, can't split it into anything that has a square root. The only numbers smaller than it that have square roots are 9 and 4, and neither one can multiply into 10. All right, and last but not least in this unit, we studied the distance formula. Distance equals square root of, 
x2 minus x1, so the difference between the two x values squared, plus the difference between the two y values squared. So we're going to calculate the distance between these two points. So our first one is your x1 and y1, and your other one is the y is the x2 and the y2. And it doesn't really matter. You could flip-flop them. we got to go the same direction. So just looking at it, if you look at your two x's, I want to do 20 minus 15. So since I want to go that direction, that means with my y's, I also have to go the same direction. So when I write this out, I'm going to do 20 minus 15 for my x's. And then for my y's, i got to go the same way. So negative 10 minus 2. So that's what's inside parentheses here, all of which is under the square root. So this becomes 5 squared. This becomes negative 12 squared. I'm going to put it in parentheses. Now when I square a negative, it becomes a positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. So this is 25 plus 144. Remember that all of this is still in under the square root. Well, that is 169, and that does have a nice square root. So the square root of 169 is 13. And remember what that actually is, is the distance between these two points, say a diagonal on the graph. If you knew exactly that one inch on a graph, that was the unit that it was counting by, you could actually lay a ruler down between these two points and you'd see it's 13. But we can algebraically solve this using our distance formula.